joining me today is Henry Winter, the Chief Football Writer at The Times. Henry, a very warm welcome to you. Hi Ruth, good to hear from you. How have things been with you? Well, I think, like everyone, um, admiring the amazing work of the uh, of, of the NHS. And I, I mean, I've been very fortunate because I've just carried on working throughout the pandemic, but going to matches without fans and live, you know, in, in my small parochial world, it was another reminder of the importance of fans. I mean, you worked at Manchester United and for me to go into Old Trafford and just to see those amazing stands devoid of human life, no noise, ghost games, as the Germans call them. It was it was it was it was really sad. Um, but fans are coming back in now and it's um, I was punching the air seeing traffic around football grounds. Uh, other day, I never thought I'd celebrate getting stuck on the North Circular Road going into Wembley. Um, but it's great, yeah, fans coming back in and it's almost like there's some light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, it's been nice having them back, hasn't it? And for the Euros as well, to have kind of crowds in Wembley and, and around the country. Yeah, definitely. I mean, going into, I mean, apart from the final where there were probably about and then about 50,000 people outside without tickets and probably a couple of thousand of them actually got in. So that was the that was the sort of the, the, the downside. But, you know, the, we are as a country, we love events. I'm sure all countries do, but we are, whether it's music, whether it's cultural, whether it's art, whether it's gardening, whether it's flower shows, but particularly sport. You know, it's like the hundred has just come at this particular time. And one of the reasons why it's been a success is because so many people, you know, in cricket have been just wanting to go to events. And my local cricket ground, Trent Bridge, Nottingham, you know, you could go in there and it was what I think was 20 quid a head, which is pr pretty reasonable for sport. Mm. And, you know, there were just so many families in there and so many people in there just enjoying congregating again, as well as seeing the cricket. And, um, you know, football's football's the same. And I was, a, was at Barrow last night and against Aston Villa. And even though that was a that was an important cup game. It was also very important as an occasion because people were able to sort of gather again properly and share old rituals and you know just simple things like sort of meeting up with friends but i did find it very poignant on social media seeing supporters posting pictures of an empty seat next to them of someone who passed away during covid and they kept their season ticket and kept their place and they just wanted almost for them to be there uh, in spirit um mm. as also as a reminder of what this whole country and the whole world's been through in the past 18 months yeah yeah that is moving very um i was going to start with the uh, euro 2020 but you did just touch on the cricket and i'm i mean i love cricket i think it's my first love really and um I was kind of quite anti the hundred because it's just not cricket and um drew got into it and brought me into it and, and you know i really enjoyed it in the end and I was talking to Matt Proctor last night, who was much of the same opinion of me. It's just not cricket. Um, but, you know, I, I really did enjoy it. And the crowds just made the difference because we'd watched some um, ladies last year. I think it was the England one day matches and there were no crowds and it was just all a bit flat and, you know, awful. But kind of it all there together and, and the crowds were just so enthusiastic for it, weren't they? Yeah. And I mean, it was just going to, I went to, I, remember, I, saw, I saw Trent Rockets against, I think it might have been one of the Oval Invincibles or one of the Southern teams at Trent Bridge. And it was great, as you say, you know, with the, with the women's game on beforehand. And we like getting, you know, I like getting value for money. So I was determined to turn up early, parked at the, the city ground opposite, paid my, uh, paid my tenner to the, um, to the guy there so I could park my car there. And I said, you need to spend it on a defender mate for forest new season he said you're the fourth person that said that today <laughs> thank you very much move along park at the cones on the back but just going into trent bridge and just seeing all the families there it was great and if so many young people are going to come into the sport and, and fall in love with cricket in that form mm -hmm. who were sort of old farts like me to sort of be patronizing about it and what was interesting is that sitting the families were sitting all around us because um, when I go to sports events as a as a punter, as opposed to a journalist, I just have to sit by the touchline. I have to sit as close as I can because, you know, it's like, you know, the press box is Old Trafford. You slightly yeah. get a broader chest style view of it. But if I go and watch my local 
um, Championship Club, now Championship Club, um, Peterborough United. I have to be as close as I can. I want to touch the winger. You know, you want to have that proximity. Um, so I was sort of sitting close to the boundary and there were sort of few families around us. Um, but they were also a classic old school, every game of the county season, diehards from Knott's who were there and they had their, you know, they had their thermos flask and they had their cheese and pickle sandwiches and they had their um, their scoreboard and they were filling everything in laboriously. There was a quite a intense debate at one point between whether they call them sets of five balls rather than yeah. six. <laughs> um, but look, if it brings people in, then, then great. Obviously, you know, greater minds than the, the, the mine in, in, in sports journalism are sort of pontificating on whether it's an issue for the test series and, and can England bat and can, can England build the innings but I've actually the test series against India has been pretty you know pretty exciting so far so mm, yeah it has it's been good but um, I think at least kind of the old guard went to the hundred and sat there and watched the matches you know and didn't just kind of stay at home go I'm not going because it's just just not a cricket and that's it's good that they you know made the attempt of enjoying it I think it was great. And I think maybe their grandchildren were saying, come on, let's, you know, let's go. Mom and dad are at work or whatever. Let's let's go to this. I think it's brilliant that uh, it's bringing people in. And, you know, your point about women's cricket, the fact that they've actually people, um, they're about, I think it was averaging sort of 12, 13,000 for some of the, uh, the, the women's games. Um, yeah. they're, you know, they're fantastic games in their own right. They were described as warm up, but they were more than that. Um, I didn't actually think the I only watched the finals on um, television, but they weren't necessarily the best of games. But it certainly looked a great occasion, though. Yeah, it did. I, th I thought it was a shame, though, that by the time it got to the trophies being presented for the men's, it was just like a football match where the crowd had emptied out because they wanted to go and get on the tube before you know the tube got busy or get the cars out of the car park, and there weren't as many people there. But uh, but yeah, I thought I thought it was okay. I think that when people I think if the people that went to the 100 go, well, cricket's really exciting, and then they go to a county game or a test match, that's where you're going to have the problem because they're going to go, well, why aren't they hitting it for sixes and fours every, you know, it's a, it's a different game, isn't it, and mentality. Yeah, they can fall in love with it. And, you know, if, you know, if only a few thousand just fall in love with it, then it's been, been worth it. Yeah, and it brings the money into the game. Yeah. Anyway, back to the Euros. <laughs> What what did you make of the whole of England's performance from start to finish? I, I thought it was great. I mean, England getting to a final was it, it was ex, was fantastic, and you know, England should be getting to the semi-finals and finals with the quality of players that Southgate's got the call upon. He's you know he's got some really good, experienced players. You know, increasingly Pickford in goal, Harry Maguire. You look at uh, Jordan Henderson when he plays, and obviously Harry Kane in attack, Raheem Sterling, I thought I had an outstanding tournament. Yeah. And then you just look at this wave, this tsunami of young talent coming through. You know, I mean, Marcus Rashford, is I, he's probably got, what, 40 odd internationals so far? And, you know, what a player he's, you know, he's he's been when he started. But then you've got, you know, and he's almost considered one of the senior statesmen. He's, what, so 23? You know, and you've got Jaden Sancho coming in. I mean, Jude Bellingham will possibly by the time of Qatar, the World Cup in late next year, you know, he could be embedded in England's midfield. I mean, he's just, you know, he's he's outstanding. So England have got, you know, we're going to have a debate all the time about which of the four right backs should start. I mean, it's great to have all this, this talent. Mm. There was a feeling how much talent did England have at left back. Luke Shaw had a sensational tournament. Ben Chilwell, yes. 50 million pound full back. Um, Kieran Trippier has played on the left for England. I think he's even captain from left wing back. So England have got, uh, you know, England got a lot of a lot of talent, a lot of depth. I think the centre half position is is still developing, but Maguire's Maguire's a, a, a class act. John Stones obviously too, and the defence was pretty secure. And everyone thought, and I thought that would be England's Achilles' heel, but actually defence defence did well. I just thought that when they got to the final, when they got when Luke Shaw scored to take England ahead against Italy, just thought you can't sit on a one nil lead against a team as good as an experienced as Italy, and against a manager as canny as Mancini. So I was I was disappointed Southgate didn't go for it. 
a little bit more towards the end of the first half, maybe bring his substitutions on. I mean, everyone's talking about Jack Grealish. Grealish, you know, what a talent, and now he's Britain's record signing. You know, he was he didn't come on until nine minutes into extra time. And he's he is a game changer. So whether it's him or whoever you're going to bring on, Sancho. I just wanted I wish Southgate had been a bit more adventurous. And I just thought what a missed opportunity that was. Obviously, in, in the end, the focus was on Wembley being sieged by two or three thousand coked up fans, whoever they were, who bro who effectively broke in. And also the horrendous racist abuse that um, Saka, Rashford and Sancho endured after missing their penalties. Yeah. You know, I mean, when I saw two white players convert their penalties, Kane and Maguire, and then three black players miss it. I mean, sadly, my long experience with England, you knew what was going to happen. And just, you know, the, um, the, the, the scum were out in force on social media and the racial abuse that they took was just horrendous. And just a final thing on that, you know, these are people going to work, working hard, working their way up, taking responsibility, none of them hit, you know, they could have said, actually, I'm not right to, to take a penalty. I haven't been on the pitch long enough or whatever. Um, but you just wanted a bit more, just, you just want the social media companies to do more, the tech giants to do more. Um, and look, it's a hate crime. If you say those sort of things to someone's face in the office, you get sacked and you probably go to yeah. prison. And, you know, tech giants clearly have to do more. Mm. But don't you think it was odd, the players that were chosen to do the penalties, you know, players that hadn't been on the pitch for long, they hadn't, you know, got the run of the play and they hadn't had the chance to get used to being on the pitch because the pen because the substitutions hadn't been made earlier. Don't you think there were more experienced players that could have stepped up instead? The thing is, is that Southgate, I mean, for for the last sort of three, four years, particularly with Southgate in, yeah, Southgate obviously knows through painful experience the importance of practicing and preparing for penalties after what happened at Euro 96 when he missed. Honestly, they, I mean, everyone says, oh, it, it almost looked a bit sort of, you know, school sports days, the way that it was prepared for the penalty shootout. They prepare everything. They will they will know everything about which way the opposing um, players will go. Pick will, Pickford will have all that information. The players will have been chosen. There will have been a long list. And then it had been worked out on who was on the pitch at the time or who can come off the, the, the bench. And the players, if you actually look at the footage and you see Southgate going around and talking to Saka and the others and just saying, you're ready to take a penalty. And he's going, yeah, I'm ready to take a penalty because they've been practicing them. So I didn't have, I mean, that was just, it was frustrating that they missed. But, you know, maybe when they're walking up as a black footballer, they are thinking, if I miss, I know what's coming my way. I know the abuse coming my way. And that is a that is a huge psychological pressure on yes. what is a very intense uh, situation. So, I mean, and that's was, horrible to think that that might be in their mind as they're walking up. Taking a penalty is, you know, in that kind of environment is tough enough to kind of have something like that pushing in as well. You can't imagine, can you? No, and I mean, it's, you know, and I feel for that. What, what's been good is particularly with Saka when he was warming up uh, the first game of the season at the Brentford Community Stadium, all the Brentford fans stood as one and applauded him. And I thought that was that was lovely. For You know, there you saw the sort of good side of, of football. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, the bad side were the, you know, the, um, the scum on Twitter. Yeah. But like you say, unless social media companies do something, it's unfortunately always going to happen. Yeah, I mean, they are, you know, there's the government, the online hate bill that's going through. And I think one of the most interesting things about that is that whether they've got the, the, the nerve to do it is that the, part of the legislation, legislation could be that they can charge uh, executives of Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, and they could go to jail. If, oh, right. If if they are not seen to be being more proactive in taking down racist abuse of black footballers, mm -hmm. perhaps that would have the effect. Mm. So um, Gareth got criticised quite a lot, particularly in the first game for the way he played defensively and against Germany, very defensive. 
what did you think? Did you think he was too defensive or just playing the game? He got them to the final. So I think that, so his tactics in terms of those games, you know, they, they, they worked. I have non-issue with the, I mean, I looked at some of the teams when they came out and I thought, well, that's a bit cautious and that's a bit of a surprise. But then, but but it got to the final, so it needs must. And um, it was just that 15 minutes after half time where he didn't react to Mancini's changes. Yeah. And then he wasn't bold enough anyway. So that that was the frustration for me. Um, and I, you know, England are going into a World Cup. You look at some of the quality of the teams around the world. I just hope they'll get to another final in the next few years because this generation of players is certainly good enough to get to a final and certainly good enough to win. Yeah, I think the expectation on their shoulders has just grown enormously since getting to the Euros final. To think of them not getting into the knockout stages now would be oh, it would be hard, wouldn't it? Well, they'll get into the knockout stages. It's just a question of what we consider as par. I mean, I think that Southgate is at some point going to be negotiating a contract extension from 22 to 24. Mm. And I think it has to be performance related. And I think if England get to the semi-finals in Qatar, I think that should trigger a contract extension for another two years. But, but I think that is the minimum. Semi-final is, is the minimum. But yes. you, know, you, you look at what he's achieved. Russia, semi-final. OK, he didn't react quickly enough against Croatia. Um, final against Italy. OK, could have reacted quicker against Mancini. And, you know, if they get to a semi-final, he'll, he'll probably go down as a, a success. He will go down as success. And I think the success of Southgate is not simply the on-field. I think it's the way that he's, he's, for a while, he almost united the nation in the summer with yes. his values, with his comments, with his support for the players taking the knee. Even things like coming out and being quite strong on why young people should take the vaccine. You know, I'm, I, I, whether you agree with that or not, and I obviously I personally agree with that, I think imagine most people would, but he is very much... Um, he's a man of principles and he doesn't hide away from them. So, I, no, I admire him. I've, I very much admire him as a man mm. or as a coach. Yeah, I do like him. And from where he's come as well, through the ranks of the FA, from, you know, the younger teams upwards and been brave enough to bring them up and not just take players that are in the team as it's been in years gone by because of who they are even if they're not producing for club or country, they just automatically got the place. He's just brave enough to say, we're going to, you know, we're going to give the young ones the chance. Mm. And and I think, I think at times they're just so exciting to watch, particularly in the World Cup, when they were just, they kind of played with a bit more abandon than mm. they did in the Euros. It seemed to have tightened up a bit. But um, I, I think he has done kind of wonders for the England game. They're, they're a very ego-free generation of players. And it's quite interesting when you talk to them. And this is something that Southgate's been very good at, is getting them to open up and talking about the journeys that they've been on, the difficulties that they've that they've experienced and overcome to get to the top. And they're, they're fantastic role models like that. You know, whatever profession you're in, you need to be able to respond to adversity. And you look at some of the, the pitfalls and the obstacles thrown at them at the moment. I mean, I, I can remember when Southgate got us to sit down and talk to Raheem Sterling. I think it was on the morning of before the World Cup and the morning's papers had all been full of criticism of his of his gun tattoo. And he, he just talked about why he had a gun tattoo and his father was shot in Jamaica and his relationship with his father. And it was quite powerful listening to this wasn't just a little bit of inky artwork. This had genuine, you know, huge significance to Raheem Sterling. And just to sort of hear their sort of backstories, you know, Danny Rose talking about his mental health issues. Carl Walker just talking about how he grew up watching the World Cup in on the sixth floor of of an estate block in in a fairly run down part of Sheffield in his mate's place. And the, the television that they watched it on was was a meter. I didn't even know they existed, it was a meter fed television and there was a jar of 50p pieces and when England were going into another penalty shootout they had to sort of put more 50p pieces in just to sort of just to get more heartache really um so <laughs> yes. 
just hearing all their journeys and obviously mark you know the best known one is marcus rashford and the, the you know the issues that he had with his his mother working three jobs to try and put food on the table and having to have school meals and you know for some it was a you know real embarrassment and they got teased at school and some some kids you know went well a lot of kids went hungry and so to then see how Marcus Rashford has taken that on and made the prime ministers and politicians see sense on that. And just to make sure that kids in a, you know, we are a wealthy first world country, don't go to bed at night, you know, on empty stomachs and just yeah. crying themselves to sleep because, the, you know, there's a hole in their stomach. Yeah. Yeah, he's done some wonderful stuff. Um, in your book, The 50 Years of Hurt, Quite a few of the players that you spoke to, the former England players, um, Glenn Hoddle, Ian Wright, um, Gary Lineker, talked about the problem with the England players is they're not hungry enough because they pay too much money. Yet you talk about people like Marcus Rashford and you know what he's done recently, and I wonder if that's still true of this squad. Oh, I think this generation is hungry. I think they are. I think that they, they they definitely are. I think they realise the pressures that go with England. So, you know, if you miss a, if Marcus Rashford misses a penalty for Manchester United, obviously that's a huge issue, but it's very much a Manchester United issue. If he misses one for England, as well as all the, unfortunately, the, you know, the sewer of social media flooding towards him, it's a national issue, it's a global issue. And I think they're able to, they realise the pressure of England, but I, and they still want to report for duty. You never hit, it's partly Southgate, how good Southgate is, built up good relations with the club managers, but they all want to report for, for duty. I think it's helped that they've all grown up through the age groups. And what Southgate did, which was, which was very cute when he was director of development, he made sure that rather than going from, say, like under 15s to under 17s, there's now an under 16s team. So every year, there would be players building up relationships. And I mean, you know, Jaden Sancho will know some of the players from having played with them in the cages of South London, sort of street football, but he'll also know them from having probably had five, six years in the system at St George's Park. And St George's Park is really important. Having one centre where, you know, the under 15s, under 16s can be training on one pitch, but they can also see the seniors. And Raheem Sterling, for instance, will go and play FIFA with the sort, you know, the, the younger kids. And there is that pathway. It's more of a, it's a cliche, but it is more of a family now. And I think there is more of a sort of a love and appreciation and desire to represent England. And of course, it snowballs. So England doing well, more people want to go. I mean, you've only got to talk to the players who didn't make the cut or were injured for the tournament or see their tweets. And they're heartbroken that they're not going to a tournament because they know how huge it is. Mm. And another thing that is mentioned repeatedly in your book when you've talked to previous players and managers of England is that one that has shown the door, that experience is then encouraged to stay within the FA. It mm. kind of feels like that might be changing now, is it? I mean, there's a thing in America called the President's Book. So each president that leaves, leaves supposedly a book for mm. the incoming president. And I mean, I don't know what's in it. I mean, it might, I don't know what Trump put in it. It might be whether <laughs> nearest course is or whatever. I don't know. But the, um, but, I, but I think it's good because we're, we're not very good at, you know, using experience in this country, whether it's former players, whether it's former coaches. And obviously when an England manager leaves, it's invariably with some, you know, lively headlines and they probably don't necessarily want to sit down with someone at the FA and talk through things and necessarily help successor but i think it's important that, that all and i think we have become a little bit more sophisticated intelligent about information gathering particularly at st george's park as the sort of the library there gets fuller and fuller you compare it with a place like Covacciano, which is the italian fa's um center of excellence and well coaching hub um outside florence and you know that's almost like a library with it'll have ancelotti's you know, will have done a thesis on Catanaccio or whatever, making things up. Um, and that will be on the shelves there. So young coaches can come in and sit down and can read about and, and just sort of learn through reading. So I think we are becoming a little, we're using knowledge a little bit better and not just sort of casting it aside. Mm. 
Mm, I think it's important, isn't it? I mean, like in any other industry, you kind of learn from others as you go along and, and take their knowledge from them and, and try and keep them within that industry before passing on to the successor. It does seem to be that it needs to become more like that in sport. Yeah, definitely. How did you become a journalist, Henry? What oh, took you into right. football journalism? I'm still trying. Um, I mean, that's the great thing about this job is that, I mean, every Friday, when the sort of the sirens stop and the heat dies down a bit from sort of going to matches and interviewing people and writing things, I always have a look back on the week. It's almost almost like a sort of emotional audit of what I've done right and wrong. And they're very rarely, um, it's very rarely a Friday when I've gone, that's a good week. It's because there's so many good writers out there. There's so many good journalists out there. There's so many more platforms out there. So citizen journalism, as it's called, slightly patronizingly, there's some really good student bloggers out there. Um, I mean, even school, I mean, I went and gave a talk at a school and I was just saying, oh, you know, has anyone actually started on football journalism? And a few of them sort of hit, they put their hands in the air. And one of them was a mad Stoke City fan. And he said, would you mind having a look at some of my blogs? They were fantastic. I mean, the kid was 16, you know, he's probably sort of maybe six, seven years away from even stepping into uh, into the media. And any stuff was outstanding. So you see that quality coming through. I think with the interest in you know statistics, I think there are a lot of people then coming into uh, sports journalism, football journalism, and looking it through the prism of statistics. I think that's quite interesting. But I just look around. I just look at the quality of you know the. I mean, just in the newspapers uh, alone, you look at a paper like the Independent, which wouldn't necessarily exist in a, in another country, certainly not on a national level like that. The depth of national newspapers we've got in this country and when I call newspapers they're basically digital operations as well so I will file first digitally and then maybe rejig something for print which comes out the next day so and I just I look at all that I mean when I did that England book I, I reread a lot of the match reports and the coverage from 66 and it was like two and a half pages maximum maybe a picture on the front I mean if, if England won the World Cup now there will be supplements, there will be yes. podcasts, there will be books, there will be films, there will be like babies named after Harry Kane or whatever. So <laughs> it's 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 huge now. So I just at the end of the week, I just look at the size of the industry and the Premier League. I mean, you know, you worked at Manchester United, how the Premier League triggered interest you mm. know, locally, nationally, internationally. And it's and it's massive. And there's so many people wanting to write about it It was when I started out in. 86 when the whole world was in black and white it was there weren't many people wanting to get into football journalism because of the uh because of hooliganism it wasn't particularly fashionable um whereas now i look around now and i go my god there's so much flipping talent you know you've got to keep running so yeah the whole which is what i like and it's a it's a meritocracy and i think that on a, on a slightly broader level Raheem Sterling when he put that Instagram post out was it three years ago now on the back of the abuse that he took at a, at a at Stanford Bridge he also called on the media and he said listen if you are going to depict young black footballers in a certain way that might then spill over onto the reaction that we receive from the terraces and also now currently on social media so the the, the media and it was a wake-up call for the media so I look around the press box now and it is, you know, there's some fantastic young black writers through BCOMs and, and Leon Mann who've, who've got me and the clubs have been absolutely brilliant, creating more space in the press box. And I just, I talked to somebody, I talked to a couple at Arsenal the other day, because if they saw new faces in the press box, you know, because I'm one of the old farts, I tend to go over and say, oh, hi, I'm Henry, you know, what do you make of the game or, you know, what are you expecting of the game? And just the talent, more talent coming through. I mean, it is just, you know, I've got a sprint just to sort of stand still. I'm not sure I believe that, Henry. You're True. one of my favourite uh, journalists because of the quality of the pieces that you've, you've always written. Well, that's kind, but honestly, I mean it. The, you know, if I look, I could name 10 fantastic football writers now who I read their stuff and I go, God, I wish I thought of that intro. I wish I thought of that line. I wish I thought of that line of attack. 
So, I mean, it's, it's, it's good. I mean, it makes me proud as a sort of football journalist, as someone who's sort of chosen this profession, that there is so much interest and so much desire to get into it. And there is so much quality coursing through. I'm, I'm, I'm hanging on in there. <laughs> good, carry on. <laughs> um, so do you think the route in has changed now from when you started? Definitely. I mean, social media is so much more interesting. I mean, people can send me CVs. I, I don't really want to know how many GCSEs they've got and whether they were captain of the you know, the five, aside, well, maybe not five aside, but what whatever they did at sort of school, I, I can tell in five minutes with a conversation with someone and also 10 minutes looking at someone's blog, whether, how well they're going to do. So, and, and there is, there's some fantastic quality out there and there's a great, I mean, I still think that a lot of the younger journalists have still got to, obviously, to understand the ramifications of taking on a job like this in terms of the impact on private life, Yes. Sort of personal life, family life, um, and just sacrificing. You know, there's so many things you cannot get to, particularly because a lot of it is, you know, you're covering night matches. I mean, yeah. I've covered in the last year. I mean, with COVID, obviously there were a lot of there were a lot more games scattered across the week, but I've probably done about 160, 170 games in the last year. And so you are, and I would have done more if the Euros had been opened up because I would have more opened up because I'd have gone and done other countries. But there's a lot of travel. But, the, you know, that's great. We've got this opportunity to go to games. I mean, I've never been to Barrow before. I, never, I didn't know that part of the country. And just to sort of experience that was 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 great. And I'm quite nosy and I quite like sort of meeting people and talking to people and finding out about different areas and why is why is it named, why, why is the stadium named like that? Why is the town named like that? Why is the village named like that? You know, is it something from the doomsday book? All sort of historical things like that fascinate me. Um, so yeah, but I mean, all of that, all that traveling, all that, you know, it, there, there is a price to be paid. And I, and I know some people who've walked away because they said, listen, it's just too much on the plan. Yeah. And I also know, you know, there are one or two female journalists who've just, how do you juggle the desire to, to 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 have kids with pushing on every night going to games I, even with a sympathetic partner it is I, i'm sure that's the same in in every in every um profession but it is a particular issue if you are going to spend half of the year away in, at night times yeah and i think you know when i was working at uh, manchester united and itv matches tended to be a Saturday or a Sunday, if you're in Champions League, Tuesday, Wednesday, or, you know, Europa or UEFA or whatever it was under then, Thursday, and that was it. But, you know, it's suddenly, suddenly Friday nights and any time on a Sunday, you know, three or four matches on a Sunday now or Monday nights. And, and then, like you say, with COVID, it was virtually every day there was a football match. I could barely keep up with when United were playing. Yeah. So to be covering that, that must be, you know, really hard going. But, 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 you know, I mean, it's not hard going in terms of it's a privilege because we get there, you know, as you know, we get the best seats in the house and yes. we don't have to pay for them. OK, we're working. OK, you don't have that emotional engagement that you would do as a supporter. Um, but, yeah, no, it is. And, I, and, you know, and I think it is. And I do talk to some of the younger journalists about this and I say, listen, you've got the talent. But actually, you know, the people who get to the top and stay at the top are people, say, like Martin Samuel at the Daily Mail who every day he starts again every day he'll go to a match or write a column and he has that ferocious work ethic so i think in this job you've got to have a curiosity about people you obviously got to love football mm. you've got to you've got to have an element of respect for the people that you're writing about and not to let them down i mean you can criticize them you know more obviously i really like harry kane i've done interviews with him but i've been very critical of his behavior over this non-move to Manchester City. Um, you've also got to be able to cope with that sleep, I think. I mean, I'm I'm fortunate. I'm I'm quite happy on five hours a night. That that keeps me sort of ticking over. Um, but yeah, so but but it is an incredibly privileged job to be able to, particularly at this time, particularly with football and English football, just so so good. I mean, look, there's been a frustration because we can't travel, but that's every job has had its restrictions yes. in the pandemic. And, you know, we just and what's also put it into perspective is that obviously a lot of the stories we've been writing in the last 18 months, we've been liaising with the NHS just to find out situations there. 
also about what more football can do and what we can maybe write to to help them in terms of particularly during the PPE. I mean, there were a couple of footballers who had parents, relatives as doctors, and I was doing interviews with them and they were saying, get the message out there that we need PPE. You know, we can't. It's absolutely vital. And so when you talk to that and you talk to Jordan Henderson about why he was so committed to the players together, uh, which has raised sort of millions for the NHS. And he said, well, all I have to do is FaceTime my cousin, who, who's a key worker, a nurse at a hospital in, in the northeast in Sunderland. And she tells me that and he says, you know, she says, how's your day been? He said, well, I got, went training and I'm trying to win the title. And he, he says to her, how's your day been? He said, well, I've just been holding up iPhones and iPads for dying relatives to say goodbye to their loved ones who can't get in the hospital. So I think when you hear stories like that, and I'm obsessed with football, uh, you know, it, it's even I accept they're bigger things than football. And I think that football's fo football shown itself really well during the pandemic in terms of the work that it's done, particularly in the communities. The fans have been brilliant. The players have been brilliant. Clubs, community foundations, too. But I think it's also put, put a lot of things into perspective. Mm, I think it has. And um, can I just get into the nuts and bolts of y how you do match reports? Um, for anyone that's watching that might be interested, because what always surprised me was before I worked at Old Trafford and I could see what was going on, when I read a match report the next day after a match, I assumed it had been, all been written um, at the, you know, the full whistle. But that's far from it, isn't it? You're writing as the match is going on. But what happens when something happens in the 80th minute, completely blows apart your entire match report and you have to start all over. What's your time span from the whistle going to you having to file? You you have to file before the final whistle. So really? I'll do on the world. Yeah, and particularly with eight o'clock games, it makes it a bit twitchier. But I mean, yes. you talk about Manchester United in 80th minute. Well, I mean, 80th minute would have been a jury with some of the uh, the Fergie time goals. I mean, I'm still recovering from 99. I yes. mean, it was just, I'd filed, I'd filed the whole piece. I'd filed, I think, 1,100 words. I was with the Telegraph at the time. And I'd filed 1,100 words on Ferguson being tactically outthought. What on earth was he doing playing yeah. three wingers in midfield? Um, and you Champions know, League final you're talking about. Champions League final in Barcelona. Yeah. Bayern Munich were, were leading. You know, it was an awful game. Mm, crazy game and then I can just remember picking up the phone as the, pre the, the print site the presses were already rolling on one little Bayern Munich and I ran out the desk and said yeah you're probably watching this you've seen this and you just have to add lib so I had libbed with Sheringham's equaliser game going into extra time and then I had libbed Solskjaer but that's like 50 words on the top followed by 1050 words sort of slaughtering Ferguson's tactics <laughs> and lamenting another traumatic evening for English football at German hands and and then you have you have about 45 minutes where you can sort of re rewrite go get quotes if, if need be and and put a bit more balance and perspective in, into the piece for the sort of second edition but the first edition obviously is 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 rolling and the start of next season you were probably there there was a press conference with um Alex Ferguson, I think he was almost about to come through Alex, and uh, he just looked at all the uh, all the sort of Manchester reporters and people like me who sort of covered the match. And he went, "I saw your first editions," because they they got the first editions in the hotel in Barcelona, so they were waking right. up. You know, was about to get on the plane, <laughs> and they've got sort of me sort of slaughtering Ferguson, and, you know, on one of his biggest days. So when he got home and picked up the Telegraph at home, if he would have read it, which I doubt. Um, he would have got a more balanced, well, he would have got a rah rah Manchester United beat. So, look, those are the things that you do. And in a way, it makes it more fun because you, you get that you get that drama and you get that ability. But also with, with digital now, you can change things around pretty quickly. Mm. Yeah, but still, I mean, having to file before the final whistle, so many goals are scored just before the final whistle. That must be a nightmare. Yeah, but it's, you know, what it's... it's you can prepare as much as you like for a game and, and television and radio reporters, uh, uh, commentators are amazing. The work that they do, they do mm -hmm. about eight hours prep for a game. Um, I quite like the fact that it is normally a celebration of the unpredictable. And the one thing I did change is that I agree with the Telegraph that I was supposed to sort of deliver about two thirds of the copy uh, just as the second half started. 
and I negotiated with them to file it at 50 minutes rather than 46 minutes with, on Manchester United games because I realised pretty quickly that Ferguson got into his players so much, you know, whether it was the hair dryer or tactical changes at half time, they would come flying out the blocks in the second half and actually maybe decide the game early on in the second half and there would be early goals or whatever and you could just weave those into copy. So I actually delayed sending uh, the main chunk of the piece until... Ferguson's furies had worked its way through the opposition. <laughs> that's good though, but that's still some experience to be able to just dictate over the phone how you want it to be rather than sitting there typing it and having the ability to change as you go. Yeah, I mean, it's more typing now, but I mean, you know, I, I grew up with copy takers and screaming oh, down true. the phone, yeah. sort of yeah. strange Italian spelling or whatever. But, um, <laughs> now, but now it's all on the laptop and it's easier. And I've got a quite sophisticated spell check, which I need with my spelling. <laughs> well, with all the names as well, I mean, you talk about commentators. I think sometimes the way they, we always said, just say it with a plum and no one will question it. <laughs> but yeah. uh, some of the names are just awful, aren't they? What did you make of the attempted breakaway last year? Well, this year, with this year, it was this year, wasn't it? Just last season. I, I mean, everyone could, everyone knew it was going to come, uh, but I just thought that everyone said, "Oh, this is one of the darkest moments in the history of English and European football." Actually, I thought it was one of the best because it it flushed out the owners who you knew were plotting. Mm -hmm. And then the reaction from everyone, from players, from managers, particularly the fans, were brilliant. I mean, yes. OK, we've gone on the pitch at, uh, at Old Trafford, but the, the demonstrations outside were good. The demonstrations outside Arsenal, Chelsea fans, it, they were so strong. And because of the power of social media and because of the power of rolling news on television, the owners would have seen that. Abramovich would have seen that and, and thought, I've misread this. I need to talk, you know, and Petr Cech went out there and he sort of, he, he talked to the Chelsea fans. And then to hear the government come in so strongly and whatever you think of Boris Johnson and whether you think he's a, you know, he's only doing it for political gain, but actually he is making the right decision by coming out with expressions like a legislative lib bomb. To drop a legislative bomb on the six English breakaway, potential breakaway club was a huge thing because the FA... It's like the smallest policeman in Trumpton blowing a very small whistle at a rather sophisticated burglar. Yeah. Whereas the government can seriously wade in with serious measures. Um, so that that was a huge moment. So actually, I thought the reaction was fantastic and it mm -hmm. died a death in 48 hours. I mean, you're still seeing, you know, the three European clubs who are still pushing it. Um, but, you know, they're on their own. Yeah, it felt incredible. It just felt like we all stood up as one and went, no, we know we're not having that. And I didn't understand how the, the owners could have misread it so much that they thought we'd go, go, oh, yeah, let's do that. Because they had an American bank who was probably in their interest for mm -hmm. the whole thing to go ahead because they were going to do well out of it. But you look at, I mean, whether you agree with this or not, it's a fact. Football fans are ingenious. And they went on to... Um, the club websites, the club social media sites, they went on to the bank that was involved. They went on to their media site. And every little thing they put up, even if it was nothing to do with the European Super League, and they weren't tweeting about that, they just got absolutely bombarded with messages saying, this is disgraceful, take it down. No one invests with these people because you can see what they're trying to do to football. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I suppose that's what really spoke, the fact that businesses were going to get hurt yeah. quite badly if they pushed ahead with it. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Well, Henry, I think I'm going to let you go, but thank you so much for doing the interview. It's been lovely catching up. It's been great catching up, Ruth, and it's been, uh, you know, I hope it all goes well with the, the healing with photography. I admire the shirt. I assume that's going to be sold in the Manchester United club shop. Oh, of course. Yeah, they're signed up. Yeah. <laughs> it goes well with the healing with photography. You know, I read your piece in the in the Mail on Sunday in the U magazine, and it was very, very powerful. So I wish you all the best with that. Thank you, Henry. Thank you so much. And thank you for your support throughout. It's been really, it's been... It's been really nice because I know that we had the gap of not speaking for a while for obvious reasons once I came back from Italy because I wasn't really connecting with anybody that I used to. And so to just be able to get in touch with you after so many years and, you know, you help, I'm, I'm so grateful. 
Well, I remember your help when we were at Manchester United or you were at Manchester United. And it was it was it was fun working there. I mean, it's, you know, it's changed a bit. Manchester United's got even bigger, but it's still I still think that Manchester United, its heart's in the right place. You know, when I talk to people on the media side, when I talk to the sort of the stewards and, and the players and Ollie, I still think your old club's in good hands. I, I I'm, not so. a, I'm not a fan of the Glazers, but the no, people no, mate. good. No, no, me. But um, and I saw you you write a piece on Twitter last season about um watching Ollie just stand to one side whilst an interview was done at Old Trafford and he didn't, you know, get upset because they were in his way, he just let it happen and he said, you know, just no ego to him. And I thought, well that's nice to know. It's nice to know he's still how he was when you know when he played for us. Yeah. I mean the you know, Manchester United kids are brought up with certain standards. You know, I mean I can remember doing a, a, a game at the it was a youth game and I was sitting, it was at Carrington, I was sitting in the youth team coach's room and one of the players came in to talk about an issue he couldn't play at the weekend. This is a young player, like 15, 16. And he walked in and before he even asked the question, he shook hands with everyone in the room, including me, a stranger. And I just think little things like that, you know, there is a certain class to Manchester United. And I was at Leicester City the other day talking to some of the players there and they were talking about how Johnny Evans had brought in a little bit of that Manchester United way of doing things even hmm. though he wasn't necessarily homegrown he was a uh, there was something about him that ferguson imprint on players is very 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 powerful that's nice to know that's very nice to know anyway henry thank you very much indeed for doing the interview my pleasure ruth we'll catch up soon will do and if you'd like to do to see more interviews then please subscribe and uh, hit like as well if you enjoy the interviews and so until next time thank you very much